Turn me up. There we go. Oh, there we go. That's better. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So I was preaching on, planning on preaching it down the line sometime. And so when Anil covered it, I was like, well, he's kind of covered it for me, hasn't he? But then I was thinking a bit more, and I was like, actually, no, there is some still, uh, a, f- a few things more that I could cover on spiritual warfare. Because the one thing I was thinking last week, although Anil laid a brilliant groundwork on the, you know, spiritual warfare and the, you know, the fight against the devil is very real. I was then thinking, okay, that's great. You know, we're meant to fight against the devil. But how do you actually do that? I was thinking, what is the practicalities of how do you do that in prayer? We're obviously meant to pray against the works of the devil whenever we encounter them. Not that we look for a, a demon under every bush and have, uh, under every tree, but you know, the, de- the works of the devil are there and around. We will encounter them at some point in our life. So how do you then actually pray against the works of darkness? And so this morning, hopefully we're going to find that out exactly. I've, uh, you know, to continue my theme of all believers, as I've been doing for all the past sermons I've done here, you know, the all believers series, we're looking this morning at the army of all believers, how we're all called uh, to do spiritual warfare, as Neil said last week, But then, you know, we're going to look, right, how do we do this? So the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize the devil's schemes. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, you know, we are not ignorant of the designs of Satan. That is, we're, you know, we're not unaware of his schemes. Satan is around and he does stuff. And, you know, in order to beat an enemy, you do have to know an enemy. Of course, that doesn't mean we should... We should not become obsessed, of course, with looking uh, at Satan and his works, but we do need to have some knowledge of what he does in order to counter something. Because if, uno- if you're unaware of what he's doing, then you can't fight against it, can you? So you need to know what the devil does. So what are the devil's schemes? What does he do? Well, first of all, he lies. He is the father of lies, as Jesus says in John 8, 44. He is the father of lies, and there is no truth in him. He speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan lies. So, you know, sometimes, of course, we'll, we'll hear lies from people, we'll hear lies from around the world, but actually, sometimes we can... Have you ever had that sort of time where you're like, you're just going through life, and then you don't quite know when the thought enter your, entered your mind, but you sort of just, you start to become aware of it. Wait a minute. What, you know, you get like a thought. It's like, what, 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 what? It could be anything. It's like, you know, oh, you know, you're not, usually it's to do with like for young people, you know, you're not beautiful. You're not worth anything. You know, sometimes these thoughts pop in, these uh, thoughts which are clearly not true, but they affect us and we start to believe these lies. These are actually lies of the devil. It could be anything, but, you know, usually it's niggling thoughts that somehow pop into your mind. You don't quite know where they came from. But these are actually the lies of the evil one. And you actually need to, you know, you need to fight against them. So there's lies. What else does the devil do? Well, he condemns. In Revelation 12, 9 and 10, we see that uh, uh, Satan, uh, the devil, is called the accuser of the brethren. Satan actually means, in Hebrew, adversary, but was used in the sense of the adversary in a court, i.e. the accuser the person in the court who would come and accuse someone of a crime. Uh, So Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he does that. He he brings condemnation upon us. See, God brings conviction of sin. And conviction of sin is when you're aware, okay, wow, this is wrong, but you know there's a way out. There's hope. When God convicts you of sin, it's never a sense of, you, you know, you're damned, basically. You're going to hell. That's it no way out. No, when God convicts of sin, he goes, right, yes, this is wrong, but here, here's the way out. I've died for you on the cross. There's forgiveness. That's conviction of sin. Condemnation is that sense of just dread. Oh my goodness, I've done something horribly wrong. And you just feel like you can't do anything about it. You just feel utterly guilty, but there's, you know, that sense of, I can't do anything about it. I'm stuck here. I'm guilty. There's no hope for me. That is of the devil. Remember, Paul says in Romans 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus has died for your sin. He's taken it away. There's no condemnation anymore. There's a way out of sin. Sometimes the devil will like to bring about past sins in your life. He'll like to target things. You'll start feeling, oh my, you know, you just feel condemned or something. Again, it usually has to do with those lies. You start getting those thoughts in your head. It's like, oh, but you've done this ages ago, you know. Oh, you lied to that person. Yes, you did do that, but... You've been forgiven if you've repented of the sin anyway. So in Christ, we have forgiveness. And uh, 
there is no more condemnation. But that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to condemn you, bring about your past sins, make you feel condemned. What else does the devil do? Well, actually, the devil can actually use sickness. Uh, usually, of course, we can naturally catch colds and flus in this world, and I'm not saying that that's suddenly, oh my goodness, that's demonic, that's of the devil. Uh, although I think, in some senses, in Scripture, we can see that all sickness is ultimately from evil. Uh, it does has now just become part of this world, and we can actually catch it. But there are times in our life where actually, sometimes where it's, you know, you're completely healthy, you're in peak of health, and then suddenly you catch, uh, you know, some really bad illness or something. It's usually quite unexplained, sudden, and sometimes even perpetual illness can be an attack of Satan. We read in Job chapter 2 verse 7 that Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Satan can attack you with sickness sometimes. So when you are sick, and especially suddenly, you've got to maybe pray and go, wait a minute, is this natural or is this spiritual? Is this actually a spiritual attack against me from Satan? It's just a question you have to ask and be aware of in times. It's not always, but sometimes it is. I mean, for example, we read in uh, Luke chapter 13 of uh, the woman with a disabling spirit, apparently. Her back was bent over and could, she, she couldn't fully straighten herself out. And when uh, Jesus healed her in the synagogue, uh, he said the Pharisees complained and the rulers of the synagogue complained, And the Lord answered them, You hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Satan can cause sickness in your life. You've got to be aware of that, that sometimes not every sickness is just, I naturally caught it. Sometimes the devil can put it on you. And you've got to be aware in those situations, oh, right. This is the devil. I've got to counter it, not simply with some medicine, but with some prayer to get rid of it. What else can the devil do? Well, the devil attacks with death in general. Death is ultimately from the devil, though it entered into this world through sin, as we read in Romans chapter 5. Uh, death is ultimately a weapon of the devil. We read in Hebrews 2, uh, 14 and 15. Since therefore children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil has the power of death. And notice this passage doesn't say that the power of death has been taken away from him when Jesus died. No, Jesus has, he died so he might destroy the one who had the power of death. And so, yes, Satan has definitely been conquered through the death of Jesus. He's a defeated foe, but Satan still has the power of death. He can still use it. If you think of it in this way, uh, say someone was, you know, really anointed from God, they were, you know, doing, had a fantastic ministry or whatever, they're really threatening Satan's kingdom. Sometimes Satan will want to actually take that person out before their type. He can use that. He sometimes kills people uh, to do that. If we think about this scripturally as well, uh, if you read about Moses, Moses was going to be a great man of God. He was going to deliver his people from Israel. But what happens, Pharaoh goes and kills all the newborn babies up to two years old, I think it's up to two years old, to try and stop Moses from dying, uh, dying, living. And then you have the same thing with Jesus in Herod's day. Herod goes and kills all the uh, newborn infants from up to two years old to try and get rid of this new king of the Jews. And of course, there's human jealousy involved, but you've got to think as well, wait a minute, there seems to be a pattern here. Whenever there seems to be this you know, amazing a uh, person of God to come and do great things for God, that there seems to be a counterattack to it to try and stop this from happening in the first place. And then if you read in uh, Revelation 12, uh, John having a vision, he sees uh, this great dragon, which is talking about the devil, and it says the devil goes to swallow up this uh, infant of the woman, talking about Jesus, uh, which is talking about that same uh, bit in Matthew's gospel, about Herod going and killing the children. What John is saying is that actually this is what the devil does. He tries to attack uh, people through their times. He uses people, yes. He uses like Herod and Pharaoh. But actually that is really ultimately the devil trying to stop people of God from living in the first place to do uh, the great things of God and ultimately threatening Satan's kingdom. So we've got to be aware of that. The devil can use death uh, even to take you out before your time, uh, before it is your time to go, to try and stop you from doing the works of, that God has for you. 
devil also uses fear, of course. I mean, we think about the Lord as my shepherd. I will fear no evil. The fact that, you know, yeah, that, that's obviously the counter it, to it. I will fear no evil, but that implies that evil can be scary. Uh, evil wants to scare you. It wants to keep you in fear because fear stops you from doing things, doesn't it? When you going out and trying to witness to people, it's fear that stops you from going up and saying, hey, do you know, do you want to come to church or something? Do you want to hear about Jesus? It's fear that stops you from doing things. And the devil wants to perpetuate fear in your life. Uh, he uses fear. We think about uh, the rest of that verse in uh, Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. You know, Jesus died so he might destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The devil not only uses the power of death, he uses the fear of death to keep people in slavery all their lives. The devil, the devil loves using fear. What else does he do? Perpetual sin can be actually a work of the devil. Sometimes when you're like struggling with sin in your life and it just gets to that point where you feel you just cannot break out of this pattern or cycle of sin, actually there can be a point where actually this is not simply your own sinful flesh, but something demonic as well, something of the evil one in your life. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity or place to the devil. In other words, there's a correlation here between being angry and sinning or whatever, uh, because when you're angry, you have a you know, tendency to sin. And so when you sin, you can give an opportunity to the devil. Paul implies here that if you sin, you can sort of open the door, as it were, for the devil into your life. And if you open the door for the devil into your life, he can then you know, wreak havoc on your life and, of course, can keep you in patterns of perpetual sin. Because the devil wants you to sin. He wants you to be away from the Lord. He doesn't want you to, obviously, uh, repent of your sin. So if the devil can keep you in barriers of sin and therefore heap condemnation lies upon you as well, then of course the devil is going to do that. So the devil can attack you by keeping you in cycles of sin as well. But also, the devil can just set up general barriers in your life, especially when you're uh, doing the works, you know, you start doing things for God in your life, and you just find that you just end up getting barriers. You know when you're like, it's really hard to describe, but I think it's more like, say, if, you know, you're trying to, like the bureaucracy of the social system or whatever, you know, you're trying to apply for like a grant or something, you know, and you're putting the paperwork, and it just feels like you're getting barrier upon barrier upon barrier. It's like that, but with the works of God. You're trying to do something for God in this life, and it just feels like, you know, you put on, say, an alpha course or something, you know, do an evangelistic event, and then no one turns up, and you do it again and again. It just feels like nothing's happening. There's no fruit in it. Uh, that's because the evil one can actually hinder you from doing things. Uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, uh, he want, this is what he says, because we wanted to come to you, that is the Thessalonians, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered Paul from going and visiting the Thessalonians. He just met barrier upon barrier, you know, whatever it may be, that just stopped him from being able to visit the Thessalonians. And Paul says, it was Satan who hindered us. So Satan can hinder your life from just doing uh, the things that God wants you to do. And of course, the devil is a tempter. He can tempt you. Think of Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel in chapter 5, uh, not chapter 5, chapter 4. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. Who comes to him? He's, the devil is called the tempter. He goes to tempt Jesus. And then Paul again in Thessalonians, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Uh, Paul had a fear that the devil was going to tempt the Thessalonians and keep them from uh, the things of God to take away their faith. The devil tempts you in life. We can, of course, be tempted by our own flesh, our sinful uh, desires, uh, as uh, James says in chapter 2, I think of his letter, or chapter 1. Uh, so, you, know, you can be tempted by your own sinful flesh, but you can also be tempted by the devil. Uh, sometimes the temptations are not just you, they're the devil as well. If we think about Jesus, Jesus didn't really have the problem with, of course, he experienced every temptation, but, you know, he didn't give in to any temptation. But it wasn't really Jesus' sinful flesh, as it were, that tempted him to sin. It was the devil who tempted him to sin. He put thoughts into his head and go, hey, what about this? What about this? Sometimes we can do that. We can get thoughts into our lives, which we would probably never think. It's like, no, wait a minute, where did that come from? 
The devil's trying to tempt you. It's not always your sinful flesh. Sometimes it is the devil that wants to tempt you. So we've got to be aware of these things. And then, of course, the devil in general just wants to derail the plans of God. Uh, we read in John 10:10 10, 10, that the thief, talking about Satan, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take away everything that God has put in your life, the promises of God, the, the good things that God has for you. God, Satan doesn't like these things. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And then the last thing, uh, the world system in general. Anil talked a great deal about this last week, about how the whole world is under the power of the evil one, actually. We read this in John, uh, 1 John 5.19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. When we're out there in the world, the devil can use the world and the world system to just, again, generally tempt you and do the other things that, you know, the devil likes to do, give, bring lies and condemnation, but just the devil can use the world to come against you, just like the devil used Herod and Pharaoh to go and kill the newborn infants. The devil can use the world. He uses people against you and I, against the people of God. So these are the schemes of the evil one. This is what we've got to be aware of. But how do we then go and fight against these schemes? Obviously, we've got to be aware, all right? Okay, this is what's coming against me. Okay, maybe a lie, maybe a condemnation, right? How do I then fight against it? Well, first things first, we've got to stay in God's will. <clears throat> Sometimes when you're coming against a uh, work of the devil, we can presume, right, okay, I need to pray this, I need to do this, uh, or whatever. But we read a story in uh, 2 Samuel about David when the Philistines came and attacked. Uh, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? The Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So he went up and attacked the Philistines. But then the Philistines came against him again. They came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, uh, the, the Lord said to him, you shall not go up again the same way you went last time. You will go around to the rear and go against them opposite the Passam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the Passam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the armies of the Philistines. What this story illustrates for us is that we can't presume every time that we should use the same strategy against the same attacks of the evil one. Sometimes we've got to uh, realize, you know, we've got to inquire of the Lord. We've got to ask, Lord, what is the strategy I need to do this? And when you're doing that, it's because you're staying in God's will. Sometimes it's, you know, you don't want to presume, basically. You want to stay in God's will. And when you stay in God's will, you'll be able to then go, right, this is the strategy I need for this situation. And then when you have the strategy, you can then tackle it, just like David did. We've also got, of course, Proverbs 3, 5 to 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't presume that you know what to do every time when you're, oh, I'm experiencing an attack of evil. And how do I pray against it? Ask God first. Stay in God's will, and you will have the strategy to do it. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Don't, again, don't presume uh, that you know the strategy. Acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Uh, no, sorry, I already said that, but sorry. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So, we stay in God's will by not presuming we have the strategy, but we inquire of the Lord first and foremost. Right, Lord, how do I pray? And wait and listen and the Lord will reveal the strategy to you. But of course, staying in God's will also includes uh, purity. Uh, when we're coming against the powers of darkness, we've got to make sure that there's no act of sin in our lives that we've not repented of. Remember, it's, sin gives a foothold to the devil in our lives. If we've got an area of weakness in our lives, you know, a unrepentant sin, then if we're going to presume to then pray against the devil, there's you know, some other work uh, of evil in our lives, or, against someone, or in someone else's life, but we've got our area of weakness in our own life, then we're not going to have much authority to pray, are we? Because the devil's Lord is like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in charge of your life now. I've got this wee foothold in your life. Hey, why are you telling me to leave? I'm not going to leave. Look, here I am. So we've got to make sure that we're pure. We've got to repent of sin uh, to make sure that the devil doesn't have a foothold in our lives. And when, we don't, when the devil doesn't have a foothold in our lives, then we can pray. That's when, we, okay, the devil doesn't have a foothold in my life. Now I have authority to pray against a power. And then also in staying in God's will, we've got to come sometimes in the opposite spirit of something. What I mean by that, if you notice there, the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 
all of the bits of the armor are talking about character, apart from the sword of the spirit. Every single bit of the armor is all about character. It's about righteousness. They've got the breastplate of righteousness. I'm living a righteous, holy life. You know, I've got the shield of faith. That's faithfulness. I, I'm living in faith of God. I've got truth uh, around my belt. I'm living in truth. I'm not living in lies. I'm living in truth. I've got the shoes of the gospel of peace. I'm living in peace, and I'm able to spread the gospel of peace. I've got the helmet of salvation on. I'm living in my new life in Christ. I'm not living my old life. I'm living in God's salvation, in his saving power. It's all to do with uh, living in the new life that God has given us at living in character. Why? Because as we live in the character of God, that somehow helps us fight against the powers of darkness. Why? Because the powers of darkness are living in the opposite way of those things. They're living in pride and greed and all the sort of manner, you know, the works of the flesh uh, that we're meant to put to death. This is all the works of the devil, ultimately, and the work that's in their life. And we're, if we're going to pray against something then sometimes we need to come against it in the opposite of that, i.e. live in the character of God. To, to tell a story to illustrate that, uh, there was a real story of a, a group of Christians who were evangelizing this city. I can't remember which city it was, but I read it in a book. I know it's true. Uh, called Taking Our Cities for God. I can't remember who's by. But uh, he went and uh, with a group of Christians to evangelize the city. And they were fine, as they were telling the gospel to people, no one was responding at all. They just found their hearts were very hard. They didn't pay any attention to them. And so they started praying about it. Okay, Lord, what's going on here? Why are they not responding to the gospel? And they sensed uh, from the Lord, there you go, there's the praying for the strategy. They sensed from the Lord that there was, there was, a, there were, there was pride in their people. They just didn't want it. They, was, they, they were all full of pride. And that the way to tackle this was that actually they were to humble themselves. And so what they did was that they all, in the middle of the street, in front of everyone walking past, very busy street, they all got on their knees, very humiliating if you do that, even the, sometimes the church service, it's quite hum- humbling to just kneel in front of everyone, especially when everyone else is standing up. So they humbled themselves, they got on their knees, very humiliating, and they prayed out loud, also very scary, uh, in front of everyone, praying for them uh, to come to know Jesus. So as they'd done that, as they exemplified humility, not pride, which everyone else was doing, suddenly the atmosphere changed and they had people responding to the gospel. And so that's just to illustrate that actually sometimes there are spiritual forces which can, uh, we usually call these strongholds, spiritual strongholds in an area uh, like pride, which can stop people responding to the gospel. But as we tackle it, get a strategy from God and tackle it in the opposite spirit, in the character of God, we can destroy these things in prayer, and suddenly people will be more open to the gospel. And that's the, really the ultimate aim of spiritual warfare anyway. It's so that we can not just defend ourselves from the attacks of the evil one, but ultimately uh, free other people from the control of the evil one so that they can come to know Jesus, so that they can respond to the gospel. Because uh, we read in Second Corinthians f- chapter 4 that the evil one blinds the minds of unbelievers. You know, why don't people respond to the gospel sometimes? It's because the God of this world, that is the evil one, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to stop them seeing the light of the glory of the gospel. In other words, in order for, or, in order for people to come to respond to the gospel sometimes, we need to actually pray against a spiritual force that's stopping them seeing it. Like in that example of that city with people's hard hearts, but when they, because of pride, but when they destroyed that sort of stronghold of pride by exemplifying humility in prayer, suddenly people were open to the gospel again. Their eyes were open. So that's what we need to do. We need to uh, stay in God's will, uh, get a strategy room, stay pure, and live in the character of God, and come in the opposite spirit to uh, certain things when we, you know, we see uh, there's pride, you know, come in humility. If we come in, if there's anger, you know, come in peace. Uh, And as you do that, suddenly the thing will break. The next thing we need to do is, of course, we need to fight with other people. This is not something we do on our own. If you think about it this way, say that there was someone who was, you know, for example, you know, a pastor. You know, they're doing a lot of ministry. They're looking after many people. They're a prime target for the evil one to take out. Because if the evil one just focuses, you know, it's strategy. If the evil one just focuses all the, his fire, as it were, his flaming arrows that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, if he focuses all his flaming arrows on that one person, 
and he takes them out, well then the rest of the flock will be scattered. You know, strike the shepherd, the, she the sheep will be scattered. So of course the evil one, strategy-wise, okay, I'm going to attack. I'm going to attack that person. And if they, you know, they themselves, they have faith, they hold up the shield of faith, and yes, that can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, but when you're getting so much fire down on one person, sometimes an arrow might slip through and hit their foot or their knee or something, and then, ouch, you know, hit. And, you know, they can be weakened by that. But, think of it in this way, if that person wasn't alone in praying and holding up that shield of faith, if people gathered around them and held up their shields of faith with them, as it were, then there'd be no way for the uh, arrows to penetrate the, that shield wall. If you think, uh, there's a, the Roman army had a, a formation called the testudo, where they would all stand in formation, they would put their shields, all, they would interlink all their shields, so they have one on the front, all on the side, and all above them. And they would march in unison together. You know, they, everyone would march, marching in perfect unison. If anyone marched out of step, they would fall over. But if they, you know, when they marched in perfect unison, they made it an impenetrable, basically, shield wall. No arrows could penetrate it. And when we, that illustrates perfectly for us, when we fight together in prayer, when we don't just stand alone in prayer, when we fight together, then we all put our shields of faith together, we interlink them, then no flaming arrows of the evil will ever penetrate. And not only can we, well, the flaming arrows of the evil won't ever penetrate, that also enables us to then move forward, as it were, towards the source of fire, because, you know, we can move forward because they, you know, they'll keep firing, but they won't get through. And then we can attack them and get rid of the source of the fire in the first place, just like the testudo formation of the Roman soldiers. And we can do that. So as we fight together with one another, that helps us uh, overcome the evil one. The next thing we need to do is we need to stay close to Jesus. Now that sounds like a a silly point to say. Of course, we need to stay close to Jesus. But actually, some people can underestimate this point. Uh, if you think about it this way, in the military, if you, you, know, if you just joined the military and you're private, are you going to be trusted with the military nuclear launch codes? No, of course not. <laughs> you're just a private in the army. And it, it's the same thing as us as Christians. When you, you know, first become a Christian and you're just getting the high of things, is God going to trust you with the spiritual nuclear launch codes, as it were, to go and launch some nukes at Satan, uh, to put it in that way? No. <clears throat> Why? Because you can't be trusted with it yet. But the, the yet is the key word. As you grow in relationship with Jesus, you can be trusted with more and more things. We see this principle in the parable of the talents in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, some, someone's given ten talents. Talent, by the way, is a, was a measure of currency in the ancient world. It was like a year's worth of wages. Very expensive. Uh, a lot of money. Uh, so someone was given ten talents. One was given five talents. One was given one talent. And the person with ten talents and five talents, they invested their money, and they got ten talents more and five talents more. And because of that, the master who gave the uh, servants their talents in the first place, then gave them more talents. Okay, I see that you can, you can use this money that I've given you. I can trust you with more now. But the, per the person with one talent didn't do anything with the money. They were scared that they wouldn't get anything from it, and so they buried it in the ground. And that servant, uh, when the master came to you know, get an account of what they used with their money, he didn't get anything. And so what he did was he took away the money that uh, the his master had given him. And the end of the story, the lesson was, to the one who has, more will be given, but to the, one, to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, if, and the point of the parable is that for everything that God has entrusted you, not just money, but everything that God has given you, if you don't use it, then you're going to lose it. You either use it or you lose it. But if you do use the things that God has given you, then God can trust you with more things. So there's a principle of trust there and relationship. As you grow in relationship with Jesus and you use the things that God has given you, then God will trust you with more things. And it's the same thing in terms of spiritual warfare and the authority that we have to, you know, tackle spiritual powers. As we stay close to Jesus and grow in a relationship with him, God can see more and more, okay, now I can trust you to deal with this power. It's usually a matter to do with pride. 
if God gave you all the power that he has straight away to like deal with all the powers of darkness, you would get very proud very instantly at first, wouldn't you? I know I would. Uh, but if you are able to then grow in Christ bit by bit in relationship and God can trust you with stuff incrementally bit by bit, then that removes the danger of you getting proud about it because it's, ultimately it's his power. So it's all to do with trust. If you have a relationship with Jesus, uh, and you obviously we, we all do, but we want to grow in that relationship. And as you grow in a relationship, you grow in trust. And as you grow in trust, God will entrust you with more uh, things. We see this, for example, in the uh, story of the Jewish exorcists in Acts 19. Uh, there's the, the sons of Sceva. Uh, they hear about Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And they're like, hey, we should do that. So, and it says this, and some of the Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying to them, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, uh, you know, to, to come out. And uh, the evil spirits answered the sons of Sceva, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And then the spirit leaped on them and mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled the house naked and wounded. Is the name of Jesus less powerful in that situation? No. The name of Jesus is still the name above every name. But what's the key difference here? They didn't know Jesus. In order to use the authority in the name of Jesus, you've got to know that Je- you've got to know Jesus. You've got to be in a relationship with him. And as you grow in that relationship with Jesus, Jesus will entrust you with more of his authority to then uh, use the name to its full effect and cast out demons and other things. So we need to stay in God's will. We need to fight with others and we need to grow in relationship with Jesus. But as we then do that, we can now finally get to what are our weapons of warfare. Uh, Paul talks about we have weapons of warfare that are not of the flesh but have divine power to destroy, to destroy strongholds. This is the crux of everything here. Right? Cause the, the rest of it has just been building up to it of how we actually do it. This is actually how you fight. These are the weapons of our warfare. Uh, The first weapon is the Word of God, of course. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 6, when we're going through the armor of God, the one offensive weapon in the armor of God set is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We, of course, fight the devil with the Word of God. Think of Jesus in the wilderness as well. How did he counter the temptations of Satan? He used the Word of God. He stood on the Word of God. He Uh, proclaimed it, he uh, said it to himself, he reminded himself of God's word, and he he used it in an offensive way. Satan says this to him, well, okay, well, well, God says this. And so when you're experiencing the powers of darkness or whatever, or you're praying against something, uh, use God's word. Say if you're praying against a lie, for example, in someone's life, if you've believed a lie even in your own life, and you realize, wait a minute, that's not true, you can tackle it with the word of God. For example, the feeling of like, oh, I'm not worthy. Uh, that's actually a lie because God has made you worthy. And then you tackle it with God's word and you proclaim God's word over yourself. Okay, well, no, actually, the Bible says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image and likeness. And though I was not worthy before, because I was a sinner, Jesus has saved me and has made me worthy to share in his inheritance. That's, second, that's Colossians 1 as well. God has made you worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There you go, the Word of God. So that's an example. Use the Word of God in prayer, whatever situation. And so I'd encourage you, of course, to learn God's Word in order to use it uh, when you encounter the powers of darkness to go, all right, I know God. Oh, I know, I know a Word of God in this situation. I can tackle this. So use God's Word in prayer to tackle the powers of darkness. But what are the other weapons? The other weapon we have is the blood of Jesus itself. Revelation 12, 11 talks about how the uh, people of God, they overcame the dragon, that is Satan, with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That sort of goes back to the word of God again as well. Testimony, by the way, is nothing to do with, I was saved on this day 10 years ago. That's not testimony in uh, the Bible. Uh, Although we use testimony in that sense, testimony in the Greek word is to do, the Greek word is martyreo. It comes, uh, that's where we get our word martyr from. The testimony is to do with, you're not your, this is when I was saved, but you're sort of standing going, I'm a Christian, 
uh, and this is so it's similar. But you know, I'm a Christian. I'm fighting and standing for my faith. It's sort of they love not their life unto death is how the the verse ends. It's all to do with I'm willing to die for Jesus, uh, and that's how they overcame Satan. Is that actually you you stayed faithful to Christ in the end? That's testimony. But they also overcame by the blood of the Lamb. In prayer, we can apply. The, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us, for our salvation, that blood also is the blood of our ransom. If you're ransomed from something, that's a freedom, being freed from slavery. What were we enslaved to? We were enslaved to sin, but we're also enslaved to Satan. We were under the prince of the power of the air, as Paul says in Ephesians 2. So, if, we're under the, if we were under the power of the air, but the blood of Jesus has freed us from that, then the blood of Jesus has power over the powers of darkness. Paul talks about again in uh, Colossians chapter 2, I think it's chapter 2, chapter 3, that how uh, he has conquered the powers of darkness through his death. Uh, So through the death of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, we can conquer the powers of darkness. So in prayer, when we're coming against the power of darkness, we can apply the blood of Jesus. Me and Harry were praying this morning for the church that the uh, blood of Jesus would cleanse us from the past to be able to move forward, not so that we can forget the past. Of course, we were thinking about Ross's memorial service the other day. Not so we can forget it in a bad sense. We, we don't want to forget it. We want to remember the good things and the bad so we can not do the bad, uh, not repeat the bad, but a, a sense of a healthy moving forward. And that's what the blood of Jesus does. It cleanses us from the past. It can cut us off from the negative things that help us move forward. And it's the same thing with uh, Jesus. For example, you know, you're struggling with perpetual sin. The blood of Jesus can set you free from that. You're struggling with powers of darkness attacking you. The blood of Jesus can protect you and set you free. So apply the blood of Jesus in prayer. It works. (laughs) It just does. Uh, You know, so for example, you'd say, right, I, in the name of Jesus, you know, I plead the blood of Jesus over Helen and her family right now, that Lord, you'd protect them with your blood. So that's an example of how you'd probably practically pray it out. So the blood of Jesus is a weapon. And finally, the name of Jesus, praying in the name of Jesus. Now, if you're like me and you've grown up in church, you've often, I've often thought uh, the name of Jesus kind of sounds like a magic word that you put on the end of prayer, doesn't it? Uh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for a pony. In the name of Jesus. You know, and therefore, it's going to work because God answers every prayer in the name of Jesus, of course. Because, I mean, he says it. Pray anything in my name and I will do it. John 14, 14. Uh, no, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, not quite. Praying in the name of Jesus. See, in the name of Jesus, uh, in, in the ancient culture, a name represented someone's... Uh, it wasn't simply their name. It was to do with uh, their character. Uh, so when you prayed in someone's name, or rep- it meant you represented them in some way, in some capacity. You emulated their character. Uh, and also not, over, not only their character, but also their will. Think of it... Remember I preached a few months ago now on being an ambassador for Christ. When you're an ambassador for someone and you're representing them, you have to represent them in some capacity. If you're an ambassador for a government, you have to live under the rules of that government. If you're not living under the rules of that government, then you're not much of an ambassador for them, are you? Because you're, you're not representing them at all in any way. It's the same thing in the name of Jesus. You actually have to, when you're praying in the name of Jesus, that means you're not uh, simply adding it on as a magic word at the end of a prayer. You're emulating the character of Christ and you're praying along the lines of what Jesus wants, according to his will. Uh, That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. So theoretically, it's actually possible for you to pray something without needing to end it with the name of Jesus, as long as you have prayed along the lines of God's will. And of course, we can learn about God's will and what Jesus wants by reading the scripture, because it's all there, uh, and also just learning how to emulate Christ. And of course, when you start emulating the character of someone, your, your desires naturally change to go in line with his will, doesn't it? Uh, so when we pray in the name of Jesus, that doesn't mean add as a magic word. It means let's emulate the character of Christ and let's align our will with his will. And as we do that, we'll be able to pray. But when we do that, that's when we can truly use the authority and power of the name of Jesus. Uh, Paul, for example, in Acts chapter 16 uh, there's this, uh, and they're in Philippi, and there's this wo- uh, little girl who's got a, a spirit in her. And uh, Paul, having become greatly annoyed by the spirit, uh, says, uh, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. There's a power and authority in the name of Jesus to 
uh, bring down the works of darkness as well. And so as we act in the name of Jesus, as we truly represent Christ, we then have the authority to then use the name of Jesus in prayer and go, right, in the name of Jesus, you know, I pray against this. In the name of Jesus, this lie is going to stop now. Like that. Okay? And those, that is how we practically fight. So tying it all together, what we need to do is, first of all, recognize what the devil's scheme is. Whatever in your life, if you recognize a lie, a condemnation, death, uh, you, know, some, you know, unnatural death is coming against some sickness, uh, whatever. If you stunt, recognize the power of darkness, that's the first stage. Then inquire the Lord about it. Get a strategy. S- make sure that you are pure, repent of sin, uh, and don't trust in your own will and understand, but trust in God's. And then fight with others. Get other people to pray with you. It's always better to fight with other people than on your own. Make sure you pray with other people too. Tell them the situation, right, I think this is what God is saying. I think this is the scheme of the devil here. Right, let's pray together. And then, of course, always grow in your relationship with Jesus. Stay close to him. Abide in him and uh, his, as, as you, John 15, if you abide in Christ and his words abide in you, ask anything in his name and he will do it. And then use the weapons of our warfare, of course. Use the word of God, the blood of Jesus, and the name of Jesus in prayer, and you'll be able to tackle the powers of darkness. And that's how we fight against the evil one. Let me end in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given us uh, your power and authority over all the works of the evil one. Thank you, Jesus, that you have the name above every name, and that at your name every knee will bow every tongue confess, you are Lord. Lord, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And Lord, you share that authority with us, Lord, that the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet, Lord, as we trust in you, are, uh, strength, uh, are strengthened in your strength, Lord, as we uh, are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, as we put on the armor of God, Lord, we can fight the powers of darkness. Lord, give us wisdom in this, Lord. Help us recognize the powers of darkness when there are powers of darkness at work. Uh, Lord, help us not, you know, see demons under every tree and over-spiritualize every situation, Lord. Sometimes it's not the devil. But Lord, help us recognize it when it is the devil and help us fight against it in prayer, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. (laughs)